What I wanted to, to talk about, uh, first of all, was the, the Commonwealth, and then strive, striving for values which uh, promote peace in, within the Commonwealth and within the wider world. And particularly, what, what does the fabric of a, a culture of peace look like? What could we suggest, or how could we grow a fabric which fosters a culture of peace? It's, uh, some of the, anyway, some ideas I wanted to put forward. So if we could go to the next one, please. <laughs> You're there. One thing I liked was at the Olympics, do you, do you remember uh, Tim Berners-Lee? Tim Berners-Lee basically invi invented the World Wide Web, right? Yes. And he said, uh, we invented this for everyone. In a sense, that, that was a wonderful thing, and I think that's a wonderful way and a model to, to do, to create the, the fabric of, a, of communication by which we could uh, develop our understanding of each other. Could you imagine if it was rented? You know, you could, you could only use the World Wide Web you know, for, for 10 minutes, and then you have to pay. <laughs> uh, we have so many other bills we have to pay that, anyway, this is one which is, which is free to to use. So the Commonwealth, a little bit of, of uh, I mean, everyone here probably knows more than, more than I do, but just to introduce, basically, these are the Commonwealth nations. And next, next one, there are 53 nations. And a, a comment from The Economist uh, back in 2013. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Commonwealth is that it exists at all. Setting aside the anti-colonial resentment, and the UK, Britain, we did many bad things. If you think of the, the history, there were many bad things that happened during the times of the empire. So this is correct. Setting aside anti-colonial resentment, almost all its former subjects have since coexisted in a club that has the queen as, at its head. The Commonwealth has 53 members and encompasses almost a third of the world's population. Among former British colonies, only Burma and Aden chose not to join. So 2.3 uh, billion people. It's a remarkable, remarkable institution. Next one. Uh, in UPF, we've been fortunate to know the, the last, the, the last sec Secretary General and the current Secretary General. Uh, this was in a UPF event with the, uh, these, this, that time was a uh, high commissioner and the, the previous high commissioner. Uh, and the previous high commissioner went on to become the, the chairman of our, our branch, high commissioner of India, and became the, the chair of our, our branch in India. Next one. And this is the, uh, the, the second from the end there. Uh, will this work? I see. Ah, uh, yeah. So the the lady uh, second from your right is uh, Baron Scotland. Yeah. So I uh, she's spoken here um, back in about two thousand and four. She came in and addressed an interfaith conference when she was part of the Home Office and became the Attorney General and so on. But she was uh, particularly passionate about ending uh, domestic violence. So she started off an NGO, and it was a passionate campaign when she was in the Home Office to uh, overcome, uh, to eliminate uh, domestic violence. It's a global, global campaign, global, yeah. yeah. And next one. So five regions of the world are included in the Commonwealth, uh, 2.3 billion people, 53 nations. One of the advantages, bilateral tra trade between nations, uh, between two Commonwealth members on average, cost 19% uh, lower uh, compared with those of any other countries. This is from, um, this is a report given by Baroness Scotland in the House of Lords uh, after she'd been 100 days as the Commonwealth Secretary General. And next one. Uh, 
So uh, another thing that she's very passionate about is empowerment of youth, and that's one of the priorities of the Commonwealth. And uh, she's here speaking to uh, Youth UPF, uh, giving them a mo motivational speech about her own career and the things that she had to overcome and, and so on. She was uh, very inspiring, and she loved speaking to, to young people. And next one. 2013 Commonwealth Charter uh, brings together the values and aspirations which unite the Commonwealth, particularly democracy, human rights, rule of law, and expresses the commitment of member states to the development of free and democratic societies and the promotion of peace, prosperity, to improve the lives and peoples of the Commonwealth. Of course, uh, like every, every nation has its flaws and every institution has its flaws, but this is the aspiration of the Commonwealth states agreed and expressed in the Commonwealth Charter. And those are her priorities. Next one. So tackling climate change, developing a Commonwealth plan to deliver COP21, uh, expanding strategic partnerships with international organizations like UN, Human Rights Council in Geneva and, and also in New York, working with the IMF, uh, WHO and La Fro Francophone. Funny. And the Commonwealth Strategic Plan preceded the launch of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it's an institution which has brought to together those aspirations and those ambitions for development. Next one. Providing uh, new opportunities for young people through the Commonwealth Youth Council, Commonwealth Youth Networks, and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Trust, including uh, new partnerships with the Common Purpose and UNESCO. So uh, working with young people, and next one. I think this is the old, and next one. This is the old version. You've got the wrong version on. No, you've got the wrong PowerPoint on, actually. Do you want to just change the PowerPoint for the, the new one, the new version I gave you? Right, OK. That's it? OK. Um, so Commonwealth priorities, uh, ending violence against women and girls and promoting uh, gender equality. Uh, this was an International Women's Day event and this man is uh, Sir Anyan Satyand, who is the, or was the, the chairman of the Commonwealth Foundation, who is addressing our International Women's Day. So I think uh, Baroness Scotland particularly, she felt the was very passionate about eliminating domestic violence and then um, this has been taken on by the different Commonwealth institutions. Next one. So the, um, yeah, this old version actually. Um, this is the, some of the positive points of the Commonwealth, that it amplifies the, the voice of the smaller nation so because they're equal partners in 53 nations, they all have the same say. And through the Small Estates Office in uh, United Nations in New York, then it gives a stronger voice for the small nations and they can coordinate their lobbying and advocacy through the Commonwealth that gives them, them more power. There's also a growth of intra-Commonwealth uh, trade and I can imagine now all the, the Brexiteers from the UK are, are thinking, now they, they really have to focus on uh, working much more with the, with the Commonwealth. And I, I, this is probably one of the, the good aspects of uh, Brexit is that there will be much more focus, I think, on, on the Commonwealth from the UK perspective. Okay, another point of, of this is that it's a focal point of development aid. So DFID, for example, in, in the UK, 
focuses on Commonwealth countries. Also voting rights in the UK. So Commonwealth citizens have some uh, voting rights if they have residency here. They also have a common language, common legal code, and aspects of a shared culture. So there is a, a greater wealth, apparently, of, of African nations that are part of the Commonwealth compared to those who are not. Uh, next. So I, I wanted to, to talk also about Universal Peace Federation and also its uh, so aspects of uh, reaching out to other nations and trying also to, to dialogue with, between nations, between peoples, between religions and so on, and work on uh, conflict situations, etc. So, Universal Peace Federation, its uh, founder, founders were uh, Father uh, Dr. Sam Young Moon and Mrs. Hak Chahan Moon, Dr. Chahan Moon. And one of their projects was the International Highway, uh, Peace Highway Project, with the idea of promoting uh, transport and communication links. Another, uh, in a sense, emphasis of Univers Universal Peace Federation is uh, equalization of, of technology. So there was a number of, of uh, machine tool factories in Germany and also in Korea and Japan, which were set up by, by the unification movement, particularly to promote the equalization of, of technology. And some of that technology was spread to other countries as well in Africa and different parts of Europe. Uh, the slogan of humankind as one family is a very central one for Universal Peace Federation. The idea that, uh, like the Commonwealth, we, ha we draw together and grow in understanding of each other. But in a wider sense, humanity is one family under, we say, under a loving God. So in our sense, God is, is not a, um, exclusive but inclusive, and uh, w which will promote understanding of of other people's beliefs in God. So the interfaith movement is something that we very much foster and want to develop because that helps us to have dialogue with, with other religions, with other faiths, with other regions of the world. The essence of a, like a highly developed religious person should be that they are concerned with other religions and other parts of the world than their own, and particularly where their, their own religion is maybe not so strong that it should be the goal of each religion to take care of the world as a whole and introduce a higher level thinking to political dialogue and decision making that looks at the, the world as a whole rather than just our realm of it or just our part of it. So following basic principles like the uh, golden rule, live, not wanting or to treat others as you would want to be treated and to, to live for the sake of others because by doing that, then there is a, a flow. You gain trust, you gain respect of others, and then trade, uh, students, um, tourism, many other things follow, investment follow, because there is a realm of trust. Business flows much more naturally where there is trust. At one time it was said, an Englishman, I don't know whether it was really true, but an Englishman's word is his bond. I wish that was always the case. But that kind of culture then promotes trade because then you have trust. When you have trust, then trade flows much more freely and much more easily. Culture is important also in a, a culture of peace. So let's, let's go on. International Highway Project was the idea to, to promote communication links, but also development links. So a way of, of building high-speed transportation to connect the people of the world. This is promoted in 1981 uh, by Father Moon and uh, International Conference on the Unity of Sciences. Uh, next one. So the, the sense of, of creating an international highway system which is pan-continental then would allow for the flow of goods and services, but also for allow of development in particular the tundra and particular areas where 
they're not covered at the moment. So when you look at the, the Bering Strait, uh, the Bering Strait between Alaska and the, the east of Siberia, then right now it's not, not so far apart, but politically there is chasms. So this has been, this would be a project which would cost trillions. It's a huge, a huge expense, particularly covering the, the Siberian tundra and the Alaskan, uh, also tundra, Alaskan Canadian tundra. So those two areas have so many mineral resources and so much that could be, could be developed to support the development of humankind. But it also could allow a much greater flow of goods and services between uh, the, these two continents. And this is the way that Asian people of, of old went, went to the Americas. And this is how they were connected when the two were, were frozen or through by boat. So this area is something that uh, Father Moon has promoted a lot, this Bering Strait project, because he feels it will help the peoples of the world to come together. Another one is the uh, Japan-Korea tunnel, which, I, again, politically there's chasms uh, between, although maybe not as much as Russia and America, but it's a difficult relationship because of history. But it, coming uh, closer, but still uh, problematic. Uh, but it's something that uh, Father Moon had investigated and studied. All the plans are made. The, the most economical routes, etc., have been planned, etc., but the, the politics is, is not there. So creating these networks actually means that there is also a political change. There needs to be a, a growth in relationship between the nations involved. One of our, our projects actually was bringing together um, Japan and Korea as peoples. I remember when I lived in Korea for about three years, and one time a, a number of, of Japanese ladies came uh, to apologize to uh, Korean people for how, how they were mistreated and because I could speak some Korean, then I, I was translating, I was taking them around. And uh, it was a very moving uh, experience. And a, a, few of, a few of the people there happened to comment that maybe the British didn't have so much to, to really uh, boast about, given what we, we had done in, in China and many other, other places. But the, the process is, is a, a good one for, um, healing the heart, particularly of the older um, Korean people, many of them who do speak Japanese and then, uh, could meet. But this was a, a, useful, a useful process. It was, this was in the early 90s when I was, when I was there. Uh, next. This is the International Highway Project. And, and again. Uh, machine tool factory, which I just mentioned. And again, another area of, that needs to be developed, which uh, is becoming more developed and sometimes overfished, but uh, there's so many uh, uh, fishing resources that can be developed uh, to solve world, world hunger. So the idea of uh, many times fish are caught, particular species are caught, and they, just the eggs are used because they're, they're so valuable. But I... Uh, to use the whole fish to grind it uh, into powder, which can be used to, to solve uh, famines, was one of the, the projects that we were, some of our, our related fishing businesses were, were doing. And uh, uh, many other initiatives happen in this realm, but fish farming is another one. But uh, next one. This uh, gentleman here is an amazing person. The, the, he promoted the Blue Water Revolution which uh, multiplied fish, still uh, freshwater fish resources by 400%. Our movement gave him the uh, uh, Sunhak Peace Prize, uh, which is a, a biannual prize of, uh, I think he got about $500,000 to, to promote his work. But he's a very humble man who 
promoted his work in, uh, in, uh, in India, in uh, Bangladesh, and Thailand, and I think some parts of Africa. But he raised whole communities out of poverty and uh, raised many people to become entrepreneurs. And by multiplying their food resources, they had more to sell rather than just subsisting. And uh, through spending his life studying aquaculture, he also received a World Food Prize, I think, in 2005. They did uh, wonderful work. Next one. Next. Oh, sorry. So uh, this uh, gentleman also received the, the Sinai Peace Prize, particularly for his uh, promotion of the, uh, the climate, climate change. He represents, uh, he's the president of Kiribati, which is one of the first islands which will disappear with the rising sea levels. Next one. We've also been promoting good governance uh, through leadership and good governance awards, this person in Lesotho. Next one. Culture. Culture is a, uh, something quite a instrumental, I think, in raising the consciousness of, of people. When our movement was very poor, uh, we sacrificed and devoted a lot of resources to developing uh, the little angels of, of Korea. And the, they were uh, grown as a, as a group to promote uh, diplomacy and also to promote mind-body unity, the sense of becoming a, a person of integrity, that to create good art, you need to really uh, sacrifice a lot and go through pain barriers. So to create a beautiful ballet, many times, you know, there, there are so many blisters on our toes, our feet, and bleeding, and so much practice and so much discipline uh, that needs to be gone through years and years of dedicating hours each day. So this way, when beautiful art is created, it inspires people also in their own fields to also dedicate themselves. Next one. Little Angels of Korea have gone on a, a few trips around the world, particularly on diplomatic efforts, and uh, they came to all the nations of the world that supported the UN call uh, to support South Korea in its, in its uh, war in civil war in the early 50s. So they supported each and they performed in each nation. Thank you. Next one. As uh, promoting the diplomacy in the early 90s, I think, I, in, in, I think it was 1990 itself, uh, they went to, uh, to Moscow and without uh, diplomatic relations between uh, South Korea and, and uh, the Soviet Union, they uh, were able to perform and Reza Gorbachev came to, to see. And one, the plan and the hope of this uh, particular performance, uh, particular visit, not just by uh, performing arts, but also by heads of state from many countries around the world and so on, and media and other, other areas, the, was to gain access to an audience with uh, Mike, Mikhail Gorbachev, the General Secretary of the, of the Soviet Union, and also his wife. So this uh, could have led, I'm not sure whether, what it was that led to the audience being granted, but uh, this, was, this happened prior to that audience being granted. So we, we hope to think that it was instrumental. But uh, next one. From this, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev also granted a few things, and one was uh, freedom of religion within the, the Soviet Union, which was changing into the CIS states. Next one. Universal Ballet Academy also has done a similar job. It's a fusion of, of Russian ballet and Korean ballet, but again, is on many tours around the world. Next one. As you know, uh, North Korea and South Korea have uh, got an intractable conflict. There is a 38th parallel, which is the armistice. There's not been a, a peace treaty signed. And there are many crises which affect this area. So the Little Angels were sent to the north to perform 
there and uh, they met with a group from North Korea who then also came to the South and they performed uh, together to, to, in a sense, to build unity between these, these two nations. Next one. Uh, another thing that uh, we've been promoting, in a sense, like the, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Union and its effectiveness in developing political s skills between uh, democratic nations of the, the Commonwealth. We are also developing a, a network of parliamentarians ar around the world and have been f doing for, for some time, but it's been formally uh, formed with under UPF Spanner called the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace. We have a number of conferences going on around the world and, and uh, regularly do uh, in the early part of the year. So next year in February, we'll have a similar one in Seoul in, in Korea. With that, uh, that's finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. excellent uh, speech on the Commonwealth and, of course, uh, bringing up the Okay, my name is Chris here. Um, I just want to know, what is the level of uh, the Commonwealth countries toward uh, the, uh, their contribution, the role I'm playing towards the achieve this, uh, uh, the peace program here, universal peace program? In terms of the government's uh, involvement towards this peace program. So we're an NGO and we have a, a presence in each country, right. uh, but I think there, there are certain countries where we have more, more of an active role than, than others. But, um, that's all I can say. But yes, we're in every country. Almost all Commonwealth countries. Right. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, here we go. Obad Dukun Thompson. Um, I'm going to be speaking later on, but I just want to ask a quick question. The reason is. I know Robin Marsh is speaking from the, from the position of the Universal Peace Foundation and its ideals. And um, when we talk about cultural diplomacy, especially this conference, it's like there's a focus on the Commonwealth building bridges. I, unfortunately, I would have loved to ask you a question, but the question cannot be directed to you because it should be directed to the Commonwealth. So what I will say is maybe just direct it to the organizers of this event. How is the Commonwealth going to be informed about the different um, issues that are raised out of this conference? And how would the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy and the UPF also follow through those issues to ensure that the Commonwealth is going to be considering and trying to implement some of the suggestions. Thank you. If I could say from UPF perspective that um, if you want, we will use our relationship with Baroness Scotland to, to forward yeah. any recommendations yeah. that you have. I, I, I suggested that you and I and Mark go and see Baroness Scotland. And uh, if you have some conclusions, uh, Mark, you could put it together and even more, more suggestions. And then we can go meet her. She is a good friend. It's just a matter of finding time on your side, on her side. She's very busy, obviously. But she's, she'd be very willing to meet us. Yeah. I mean, that would be one way. Why don't you write all your comments? Everybody can do their contributions. 
and then can be checked by Mark, and then it could be done. It's quite easy to do in, in principle, but they have to be both free. Mark is also busy, mm. but the Bar mm. Scotland is certainly busy. Uh, there's another question over there. Thank you very much. It's, indeed, it is a pleasure for me to be here this morning. My association with Commonwealth is a very long stangy one. It started in 1968 mm -hmm. when I came to United Kingdom on a Commonwealth Press Union scholarship. Mm -hmm. And we were here for a year. And I tell you, it was a fantastic experience. And ever since then, I'm wedded to the Commonwealth idea. It's mm -hmm. perhaps the only voluntary association where force, is not, force has not brought us together but our own necessary compulsions. Mm. And I'm sure Universal you know, Peace Federation mm. is doing a fantastic work and uh, hope that more and more people should pass, participate in it because that is what the world needs, peace. And as a matter of fact, I wanted to say that there has got to be greater cooperation among the journalists between the Commonwealth countries. Press, Commonwealth Press Union was doing a fantastic work and I don't know what has happened now. I've not been you know, keeping track of it. Besides that, there's another thing which is very common among the Commonwealth countries, that is cricket. Yes. We, used to, we used to have a Commonwealth cricket, international cricket team at once upon a time. I think that, that thing has gone away now. Cricket Thank you very much. Cricket. Very kind of you to have uh, given me this to revive it. <laughs> there is a, a Commonwealth Journalists Association which Anyway, it's, it's very active. I, I know some of the people. So. Uh, hi, Peter Aruja, Malta. As many of you probably know, Malta is currently the chair in office of the Commonwealth, uh, and that's because last year the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting was held in Malta. Uh, that was preceded by various fora which address civil society concerns. There was the Women's Forum, the Youth Forum, the People's Forum. I wonder whether the Universal Peace Federation was involved in any of those fora, and um, if so, what focus was brought to that space? Because uh, in terms of the interfaith, which is a main focus of what I do with the, the President of Malta, that really wasn't addressed throughout, um, although we, should. we certainly should. There are plans, in fact, the, the um, uh, Chief Rabbi of the Confederation of uh, Commonwealth. Uh, yeah, well, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure, because I, we have a branch in Malta, and um, so I'm not sure what involvement there was in, on that level, unfortunately. But um, interfaith is a, is a big thing for us, and uh, w for the last 20 years we've been having interfaith events, in, more than 20 years actually, in this room. And uh, we have some very close friends from, d from different backgrounds. But the idea of the, of the interface between religious leaders and politicians is, uh, is actually an important one. <coughs> to, to put the dichotomy of those who are responsible to their, their electorates and the self-interest of their electorates and those that have a, should have a bigger vision, a worldwide vision, I, that um, that give and take relationship, that dialogue is, is a very important one to, to have, to hold politicians to account, to hold religious leaders to account as well. <laughs>